Hello and welcome to my presentation covering muscle contraction. We will discuss a little bit about muscular anatomy as well as the details of contraction. So let's begin. If you're taking a look at a skeletal muscle, um, you see the basic makeup here. It looks like it's made of different bundles. Well, a whole muscle such as the bicep is made of different bundles. These bundles are called fascicles. And you can see one right here. There are several connective tissues that connect all this together. The outside that holds the entire muscle like a bicep together would be the epimysum. You also have a perimysum right here that goes around that fascicle in white. And if you notice, there's white in between all these little muscle fibers or muscle cells, and that would be the endomysum. So the whole thing is wrapped up in a lot of layers of connective tissue. If you pull out one fascicle, you'll notice that it's also made of a bundle of muscle cells. And this is going to get even smaller. So it's just a kind of a rebundling process. But this would be a group of muscle cells. They're sometimes called muscle fibers because they're very long and very skinny, much like a fiber. That's the basic structure of a muscle. If we zoom in a little further, you'll find that the muscle cells are made up of smaller units called myofilaments. These myofilaments are proteins. Um, if you look at a muscle, it appears to be striped or striated for a skeletal muscle. And that's because in this A band, you find lots of myosin, which gives it a darker appearance. And in these I bands, you know, you see none of the red myosin fibers, which gives it a lighter appearance. Your Z disc series of proteins here is what holds actin to actin. You also have what's called an M line right here, and this is a set of proteins that holds mice and fibers together as well. See it? This is a more blown up image. You see the Z disc here holding actin to actin, just another set of proteins, and the M line here, myosin to myosin. Uh, the distance from one Z disc to the next is termed one sarcomere, and a sarcomere is the functional unit of a skeletal muscle. This little bitty tiny guy here that's a two micrometers or so in length is what actually contracts. So very, very, very tiny. Now there would be just trillions of these inside one bicep. So if you sum up the full distance of contraction, say in this one moves a few nanometers and so does this one and so does this one, you multiply that up, you get a, a full contraction of about 30% for a single muscle, such as a bicep or a quadricep group or something like that. Basics. Thick filaments in red called myosin, thin in blue called actin. z disc proteins hold actin to actin. M-line holds myosin to myosin. And what's going to happen during shortening is these blue fibers are going to crisscross over each other. And this unit here, this sarcomere, will actually do the shortening. These little tiny heads will bind to this actin and bring it in this way. These will bind to this actin, these myosin heads, and bring it in this way. And you'll actually have blue fibers crossing over into this H zone. What you see here is bare. There's no blue fibers, no actin. So this would be a picture of an uncontracted muscle fiber. This is a picture of a real slice of skeletal muscle tissue. Uh, if you look at it, it appears striped. The striations come from the band, with the dark bands being where most of the myosin is, and the lighter white bands in between being where the actin is. So if you go backwards, you see this would be a dark band, A band, and the light band would be the I band. That gives you the full appearance here in this muscle. And skeletal muscle cells are voluntary and multinucleated, also have tons of mitochondria. If you take a look closer, this is transmission electron microscope images. This one's been artificially colored. This is how they naturally come out in black and white, but this is a real life image using an electron microscope. You can clearly see the M line, you know, the Z discs. So see how this band here is kind of lighter, the white, and this one's darker. So from one Z disc to one Z disc, you've got the sarcomere here. This is the contractile unit. If you look down here, you see ton of mitochondria. Now, if you'll recall from AMP1 just recently, uh, and mitochondria is where you have the production of adenosine triphosphate occurring mostly, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. ATP is going to be required for all muscle contractions, so that's why a muscle cell typically has lots of mitochondria. As you can see here, it's the cristae of the mitochondria. This one's artificially colored, showing you the dark bands and the light bands 
from Z disk to Z disk. So this would be one SAR premiere. Now keep in mind these are real life images using electron microscope. Um, then this one's just been artificially colored going in color later. If you blow up a sarcomere even greater, you see the thick and thin filaments, the myosin and the actin. Well, myosin's got all these little tiny protein heads all over it. Now, keep in mind, all this is protein. And actin has two extra proteins that wrap around it, called troponin and tropomycin. Tropomycin's the string, troponin's the little yellow guy here. If you look at the myosin head in detail, there's an ATP binding site and an actin binding site. This is where this protein can bind on to this little indentation here. This is the active site for myosin. This is where myosin heads will attach. But if you notice in this picture, they're blocked by tropomycin. So one of the jobs in muscle contraction is to remove tropomycin and expose those myosin head binding sites on the actin subunits so that myosin can bind to actin. Now once it sticks, these little heads can grab and with the help of ATP pull backwards. Grab and pull backwards and these blue fibers will crisscross into this H zone. That's the basics of sliding filament theory. This is a more blown up picture of just a group together. If you look you'll notice transverse tubules here in white and in blue you'll also see SR that is the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they're all interconnected so the outside of a muscle cell or muscle fibers is called the sarcolemma. This is just a specialized plasma membrane. It invaginates and runs completely through the width of this muscle. You see these little white tubes, these are just extensions of the sarcolemma. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is attached to it and it sequesters or holds on to calcium. So an electrical signal can travel down this sarcolemma, that's what it's specialized for, it can carry electrical currents, and through this muscle all through to each one of these uh, because of these transverse tubules. And you also see pictures of all the mitochondria here as well. Sliding filament theory is what we work off of um, for anatomy and physiology to explain muscle contraction. Uh, Gene Hansen and Hugh Huxley, 1954, were instrumental in developing this model. Proposed that skeletal muscles shorten by the actions of mice and an actin sliding past each other. Hence the word sliding filament theory. If you take a closer look at muscle contraction, we'll begin with a nerve firing on the sarcolemma of a muscle. We'll blow this up bigger here in a minute, but basically a motor neuron has to come down and actually send an electrical signal, electrochemical impulse, to the group of muscle cells that say that make up my bicep. What's actually happening here gets pretty detailed. As the electrical current travels down the membrane, of this axon. The change in voltage opens up calcium channels. Calcium rushes in, causes vesicles that the Golgi apparatus is made that are filled with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine to go through exocytosis. Vesicles are released and acetylcholine then diffuses across this gap and will bind to receptors on the cell membrane, the sarcolemma of the muscle. If you take a look here, you see acetylcholine diffusing across the synapse, the gap, binds onto these little sodium potassium pumps, opening them up, and sodium rushes in, potassium out, and what we call this is depolarization, and this starts an action potential. So basically, the flow of ions, positive charges, is our electrical current, and it will travel down this sarcolemma, and eventually through it, so it's going to go down the length and the width of the muscle. It goes through the width via the transverse tubules and it will just keep on going from here, this action potential. So electrical signal from a nerve, release acetylcholine, starts an action potential, and now we're heading down a muscle cell. That action potential is going to be propagated or carried both down the sarcolemma and through the muscle by transverse tubules. Now as this little action potential travels right down this transverse tubule, the change in voltage, voltage sensitive protein, will cause these proteins to pop open and that will release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now what calcium is going to do, once it's released, is bind to troponin. So troponin tropomycin right here is blocking, blocking myosin's bindings out on actin. With calcium present, it will bind to troponin. This will change the shape and move tropomycin, thus exposing the binding sites for the myosin heads 
on your little active subunits. Calcium binds to troponin, removes tropomyosin, and allows myosin to bind to actin. Now these two can react. So we've got a cross bridge form. Myosin is now stuck to actin. Now we've got to get this little head to contract and pull that actin filament. That's the next step. Remember it had an ATP binding site. It'll break the ATP up into adenosine diphosphate and your extra phosphate group here. And the release, the phosphorylation of that ATP will cause that myosin head to contract. So with ATP present, it pulls in and that fiber moves this direction. These heads here pull this way, these pull this way, we move towards the H zone. That's making this sarcomere, this one unit, the contractile unit of a muscle, shorten. If you want to release the myosin heads, new ATP is required so that it can rebind here, so it'll phosphorylate. It'll go right back through these steps where it attaches and pulls, and then new ATP. So basically these can grab and pull, grab and pull, grab and pull all using adenosine triphosphate. As long as calcium is present and tropomyosin is out of the way, this will just keep happening and that muscle will keep shortening and contracting. Now what keeps the calcium present is the action of the nerve. Remember it's the change in voltage that causes these proteins to open, allowing calcium out. So when the, when the signal from the nerve ultimately stops, no more release of acetylcholine, you shut down this whole system and these channels pop back closed. Calcium is no longer present. Without calcium, you go back to something like this where troponin and tropomycin are in their normal position, let's say, and blocking myosin's binding actin. So you stop the muscle from contracting. Now, if you've ever moved anything in your body, and you have, this all happens very quickly. Uh, the details of this taking the time to write out if you follow them through from start to finish here. This is the basics of your essay question. And for AMP1, muscle contraction is an essay question. And this is the proper answer, basically the minimum I would accept on a test. So take your time and read over these steps, then go back through those steps with all these pictures and walk yourself through it. The other thing you can actually do, Google muscle contraction, sliding filament theory, you will find tons of videos. I was looking earlier and I actually found one made by some high school students that sang all of this to a Taylor Swift song. And they weren't very good singers, but you know how songs are, they can stick in your head. So I guess one of their school projects was to learn muscle contraction and they made a video online singing it. And there are many, many other videos at the touch of a button. Big essay question on your test. Lots of points here. Follow this through.